Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor alleges that President Zelensky may have brought Epstein tapes to Washington to leverage against President Biden and Congress for financial support. He suggests that amidst the tragedy of the situation, the political landscape has descend into farce with relentless lying becoming the norm. McGregor argues that in the face of failed promises and disastrous policies, politicians double down on deceit, aided by complicit media. He points out the media's reluctance to thoroughly expose falsehoods, drawing parallels to the lack of scrutiny during the Vietnam War era. Well, first of all, regarding Mike Johnson, he's known for his generous support, particularly towards Israel. However, if he were genuinely prioritizing national security, he would be advocating for an immediate deployment of 60,000 U.S. Army troops to secure the border with Mexico. These troops would be tasked with combating human trafficking and drug smuggling. Additionally, he suggests utilizing the United States Coast Guard to patrol domestic waters rather than the South China Sea, which he views as a misplaced allocation of resources. He questions whether Johnson's allegiance lies primarily with Israel or with the United States' own interests. Despite his support for Israel, he emphasizes the urgent need to address domestic security concerns first, particularly at the southern border. He expresses frustration at the current state of affairs, attributing it to reckless monetary policies and a lack of prioritization of domestic issues. Our financial system is on the brink collapse, according to experts like Alistair MacLeod and James Richards. It's not a matter of if it will fail, but when. Yet this system, fueled by government spending, is also what sustains our economy. However, what are we really producing or contributing to society? Many executives prioritize profit over actual production, focusing solely on shareholder value. They acknowledge the need for change, but claim their pressure to maintain the status quo by politicians and military leaders. This profit-driven mindset has shifted focus away from providing quality products at reasonable a principle abandoned since World War II. It's a cycle driven by money, leaving little room for meaningful reform. The focus for many corporations is maximizing profit for shareholders, often led by individuals with financial or legal backgrounds rather than technical expertise. This prioritization of profit over innovation means that concerns about product quality or effectiveness, like those raised about the M1 tank series in 1991, are often overlooked. Decision makers cater to the demands of military and political leaders, even if those demands are unrealistic or technically unfeasible. A corporate officer once recounted a meeting with General Shinseki, where it became clear that the military's expectations were impractical. However, when faced with resistance, the response was simply to take business elsewhere. This highlights a cycle where profit trumps practicality, even at the expense of technological limitations or common sense. If we decline the contract, another major defense firm will snatch it up, resulting in a loss of billions for us. It's a tough situation knowing that what we're being asked to provide might not be feasible or effective. But here's the silver lining often. Despite the spending, nothing substantial comes out of it. Congress seems more concerned with the money spent than the actual outcome. Problems. As for General Hodges, his comments are sadly typical of many senior military figures nowadays, when it would be helpful if the public were made aware of their affiliations, whether it was defense contractors, think tanks, or foreign lobbies. Hodges' remarks strike me as ill form, perhaps suggesting he lacks practical combat experience or a deep understanding of warfare. Overall, it's a troubling trend that warrants more scrutiny. I doubt this situation will persist for another six months. If we fail to establish a new government aligned with our interests, perhaps a different outcome will emerge. Some may argue that Zelensky is corrupt but also compassionate. However, if he truly cared, he would have intervened earlier to stop the conflict. Reflecting on history during World War II, German generals remained loyal to despite his atrocities. This lack of intervention caused countless lives. We face a similar dilemma now where inaction prolongs suffering and conflict, providing more weapon will resolve complex geopolitical issues as seen in conflicts like Gaza. True security requires more nuanced approaches than military force alone. This approach is futile and obscures the truth, a stance that you and many others seem to endorse. Without reliable sources from Israel, I hesitate to trust the reported numbers. However, if even remotely accurate, the Israeli losses in Gaza are already staggering. 
The situation is dire, with ongoing casualties and simmering regional tensions. While governments may prefer peace, public sentiment is increasingly hostile, risking destabilization. The leadership in Jerusalem dictates terms and actions, but the situation in Kiev remains grim. Despite the evident futility, violence persists, reminiscent of historical atrocities. The reluctance to confront this reality mirrors the failure to act decisively in the past. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I foresee further deterioration and potentially reckless proposals, such as the rumored deployment of foreign troops on Israel's border with Hezbollah. This course of action could escalate tensions dangerously. This approach resembles a modern-day version of the Nazi-Soviet pact, a temporary ceasefire to buy time before resuming hostilities. It's unlikely to yield any meaningful progress, and I'd be surprised if Hezbollah and its backers in Tehran see it as a viable solution. Given our contentious particularly regarding Russia and the inflammatory rhetoric used by leaders like Netanyahu and Herzog, our credibility is severely compromised. It's as if we're careening down a mountain road in an out-of-control 18-wheeler with no brakes and disaster looming at the bottom. This lack of restraint not only jeopardizes our own society and nation, but also risks dragging our NATO allies and Israel down with us. The events since October 7 have alarmed not only Arab leaders, but also observers worldwide. While some may argue for punitive measures, it's essential to consider the broader implications and seek constructive solutions. The death toll is staggering, and the conflict has escalated into a full-blown war. From the perspective of Arabs, Iranians, and Turks, this is viewed as a struggle for Jewish dominance in the region. Unlike past conflicts with occasional territorial exchanges and periods of relative calm, this situation lacks diplomacy. Instead, it's fueled by a cycle of vengeance and hatred, which will only lead to more suffering. It's imperative that we halt the fighting immediately and engage in meaningful dialogue. The first step is a ceasefire, followed by negotiations on the battlefield and political discussions elsewhere. Redrawing maps and finding a sustainable resolution is not unprecedented in history. Just as in medical emergencies, the priority is to stop the bleeding. This approach applies not only to Ukraine, but also to Israel, although the path to resolution there appears more challenging. Ultimately, the focus should be on the well-being of the Ukrainian people and the nation rather than the interests of corrupt individuals.